You're not excused yet, big guy. Do you golf? No, I've never heard you no, talk about yet. golfing but, once in your but life. But if I can use that as an excuse to leave, I will. <laughs> well, you only have 25 more minutes of service time. And, and with you and Maria, I cherish every moment of it. As well you should. Yeah. Uh, Maria. Cherish? You cherish. cherish. Well, that's what he did that's say. a wow. good word. Wow. <laughs> I'm not being criticized in that word, am I, Rob? Not at no, all. sir. Not at all. But I was, I was taken aback when he said, I'm going to kick the hornet's nest down the road. Because we talked about mixed metaphors. You either kick the can yes. or you kick the kick hornet's, the hornet's nest. nest. But you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to kick the hornet's nest we, down the road. Two days in a row, the mixed metaphor. Two days in a row. Never occurred to me, Maria. That's why I, I value your comments. You got so your much. editor to the left here. How about that? My uh, college football coach once said, We've got our hands cut out for us this week. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's going to be making it difficult to catch the football. Yeah, it you know, would. You got your hands cut out for you. Uh, one comment before we move on. Um, you know, in the Facebook comment section, you know, you've, it's obviously it's a free for all. You can yeah. you can say what you like. Um, I've been. I first started hosting a talk show in 1995, and I started here in 2010. And uh, I have a couple of rules that I enforce without exception. And, and one is, uh, can you send me all your questions in advance? And the answer to that is no. And it's not negotiable. The answer is no, and it doesn't matter who you are. And you're talking about a guest coming on. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, you can say, what topics do you want to discuss? And if it's an elected official, I'll throw those out there because if you're in the state legislature and we're proposing 3,000 bills and you want to bring up an obscure, weird one that they can comment on, they should have the right to know what one of the 3,000 they need to look up first. I think that's fair. I'm not going to send you all my questions for the interview. And I, I, I've turned, I've lost interviews because people would say, I'm not, well, if you don't send me the questions, I'm not doing the interview. I'm like, fine, then you're not doing the interview. Yeah. Uh, the other in, 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 a, in a similar way, let me just interject. Yeah. People would say to me, can we read the story before it yes. goes to print? It's you, the you, same theory when days. I was, yeah. when I was the editor. And you have certain, you know, if you, if no, you studied you journalism in college and whatever, as, as I did, there are certain hard and fast rules you follow. Can't do it. Another one is, uh, the guests uh, in advance saying, I won't talk about this, I won't talk about that. Uh, that's fine, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to ask about it. So uh, there are, I saw at least one comment in there about a certain subject and, and whatever. And no, the sheriff does never, doesn't ever set down ground rules. You can't ask me about this, you can't ask me about that, nor does anybody else. Because if they do, I'll go, that's great, I'm still going to ask you about it. You can say no comment if you want, but I'm still going to ask you about it. Uh, that's a hard and fast rule. And I've lost guests because they sure. have told me in advance don't ask me about this and i've asked them about it anyway and after the show is over they made it clear they would never come back on the show again that's fine that's their right i understand that but in regards to some of those comments that show up in the comment section at times uh maybe you make those comments out of frustration or whatever and that's fine but understand that's not there are no guidelines sure. or guardrails when we do interviews here you know let me pick up on some of the comments we had today one of the things that i surprised was surprised and i found a little disappointing that some of the comments still enlist or still incorporate we against them approach mm -hmm. we should be beyond that we should be working together to solve the problem and not drawing a fence between this side and that side especially when it comes to school safety exactly right. amen right. Uh, Nikki Bigiarelli is the new CEO of Hospice of the Panhandle. She joins us via telephone this morning. Nikki, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It is wonderful to have you on the program. Tell us your story, Nikki. Yeah, my story. So I am a native um, West Virginia, grew up certainly in Berkeley County and, and went to school in Berkeley County. I'm a graduate of Shenandoah University. I'm a registered nurse by trade. I started out my career as a registered nurse in critical care and cardiac care. Um, I always joke and tell people um, when I was graduating high school, all my friends went off to senior week, and that same week I went off to hospital orientation. <laughs> and, you know, my career really started there. And it was early on in my career that I had um, just personal experience um, that was life changing and uh, developing for me uh, with hospice and end of life care that I, I really realized um, this is where I want to be and this is what I want to do. So, I've been with our organization for 13 years. I started out as a registered nurse at the bedside. Um, three years into being a registered nurse, I uh, quickly realized, you know what, I think I want to 
um, learn more and do more for this organization and one day hopefully lead this organization. So I've certainly had quite a few progressive leadership roles over the years. I think I've managed and led just about every single clinical team within the organization from home care to inpatient care. Um, and now here I am, fortunate enough uh, certainly to get to work in something that I truly believe in. And I'm really looking forward to um, building upon what Margaret as a legacy leader has created for us, not only as an organization, but certainly built within this community. Well, let me just say to Bill and Maria, who are both actively involved with Hospice of the Panhandle, I salute you. It's about time we had somebody with a vowel at the end of their name running <laughs> such an important place. And I think we should have done this years ago. It's about time. I'm going to regard this as Independence Day 2023 for me. There you Thank go. Thank you very much. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. For, uh, uh, for the listening audience, uh, we did, as when we realized Margaret was leaving, we did not just reach down into the organization and ask who would like to uh, replace Margaret. We did a national search. We had candidates from all across the country to apply. Uh, we had a very rigorous selection process. And the fact that Nikki was chosen, I think, as a phenomenal tribute to Nikki, also to the hospice program as well, that uh, Margaret has been able to train individuals with the, with the skills to move into this role and probably move into the role fairly seamless, especially considering that they were facing national a competition and Nikki came out number one number one yeah. Maria um, so Nikki talk a little bit about um, Bill sort of outlined the process and it was indeed rigorous on your end six months I think it was yeah. um, and um, you know talk a little bit about what it is that you want to do not necessarily first out of the gate but i know you and i have talked about all of the changes in the hospice world medicare medicaid um payment structure all of that kind of thing what's what's your first priority that you um that you want to look at yeah i mean i think you hit on that certainly the the reality is the work that we do um well, first of all, it's so meaningful and impactful, but the the hospice world, you know, larger hospice world, is, the reality is that it's changing. The hospice benefit that, you know, as we know it today, um, it turned 40 in 2022, which is, you know, uh, people with a, a terminal prognosis of six months or, or, or less, um, that's the only qualifying criteria. That certainly um, that is certainly going to be shifting in and, and the, the years to come, I think, sooner rather than later. And really what's shifting is more of a focus and approach to care um, in that post-acute care continuum to focus on advanced illness management. So, um, you know, as an organization, we're going to continue to find ways um, to be successful, certainly as successful as your um, nonprofit uh, community hospice. Um, I think we're going to absolutely find ways to strengthen who we are and expand our service lines. Um, I, what for me, a priority, our, our future is to be connected and entwined with our community and certainly allowing the community needs to define some of our future business plans. And, and that really, you know, with expanding our mission, serving hospice patients for longer periods of time, um, if you read my journal article, one of my goals too is to be expand to be able to expand palliative care services. Um, another priority is um, being able to grow existing relationships and partnerships. Um, but in all of that, Maria and <clears throat> Rob and Bill, for me, um, is we must never lose sight of our mission. We're going to continue to bring passion and purpose. Um, to all that we do, especially as we explore opportunities outside of maybe the traditional hospice lane to align ourselves um, with what I just spoke on, that advanced illness management. And I, th I think, too, and, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, I think people, I've been there 15 years this year, you 13 years, people still have the misconception that you call hospice and you come in in the last three days of life. Yeah, and I, yeah go ahead. <laughs> I'd say that's, that's a daily challenge we all face um, from my role to boots on the ground to patient, you know, patient care at the bedside is just combating those misconceptions 
Um, and unfortunately, sometimes those misconceptions result in public public negative perception. Um, and that presents itself as a tremendous roadblock that we truly only come in to in those last moments of life. And, you know, Medicare, uh, the, the regulations that we, that we follow and the rules that we follow, um, certainly we are required to, to work together as an interdisciplinary team. And that's what sets this work apart from anywhere else in healthcare is our holistic approach to care mind, body, spirit, right? We don't go in and just treat um, someone and let, a I would say, a disease define someone. We work together as a team um, approach to caring for individuals, um, certainly with chronic illness and, and at the end of life. Nikki, let me expand on that just a little bit. Uh, we, you mentioned Medicare and that uh, and many of the patients, mo a lot of the patients get their support through Medicare. Yeah. But that doesn't cover everything. <laughs> uh, no. In fact, uh, the, uh, we get a tremendous amount of support from the community, both in terms of dollars, such as the fundraiser that Maria mm -hmm. and David uh, Asham are putting together in a couple of so months, uh, or, but the other thing are the volunteers. We have, if memory serves, around 300, 350 volunteers. 200. 200, 200. volunteers, mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. we, uh, so between the, without the community support, we would not have the hospice that we know today. Uh, so uh, I think what your, your vision is just going to expand upon the legacy that Margaret has left us, uh, but it's going to be fulfilled through the benefit or the participation of, of the community. Absolutely, and, and you're right, Bill. We would not be as successful in who we are today without the generosity and the support of this community. You know, I tell people all the time, uh, around 80, 90 percent of our patients, 85 to 90 percent of our patients are, you know, were funded by certainly Medicare. And with that, what Medicare has said to us year after year and really the last five years from a quality perspective is we expect you to do more uh, for patients and their families, but we're going to pay you less. And so we do, you know, we do depend on the generosity of the community to certainly um, to help us really fill that gap and, and you know they pay us a fixed daily rate with no additional balance billing <laughs> certainly allowed um, in all of that so and and that's what I always tell people um, you know when they as you said most of our patients are Medicare Medicaid patients over the age of 65 actually the vast majority over the age of 85 so you're right. still safe for a couple years Bill um, <laughs> but that was a shot Bill <laughs> yeah was. yeah but but it did not go over my head. It did not. It, it, it did not toward the it body. Hit, it toward the heart. <laughs> but um, you know the bottom line is that um, the the support that we receive is absolutely phenomenal and astounding. But um, because I always liken it to when you go to the doctor and you pay your copay that and then the copay helps but you generally can get another bill even after insurance is applied to that so at hospice you don't do that you never get a bill it's we get a fixed rate as nikki alluded to every day and um and you know bill is well aware having sat on the board for many years that it, that we try to do everything that we can for patients. If they want to, if they want to go fishing, we get them to Cacapen State Park. If they want to um, have a last meal of oysters, we make that happen. And that doesn't usually come just with the Medicare benefit. So, no, absolutely not. And while I only really hit on the people <laughs> portion of that and, and the team approach, um, there's so much more to that that, you know, people are truly surprised to know that we're going to pay for your medications that are related to your terminal diagnosis. We're going to pay Pay uh, for your uh, durable medical equipment, your medical equipment that's necessary for you to be in the comfort of your home or wherever you define home. 
um, you know, we're going to pay for your medical supplies so you're not having to run out to the local drugstore or order off Amazon <laughs> to have, you know, X, Y, and Z delivered to your home. We're going to cover all of those things, um, and we're going to ensure that you have um, everything everything you need um, to really be in the comfort of your home or at our facility or wherever you define um, home, certainly. We're talking about the, uh, the patient right now, but let's not forget what hospice does for the caregivers and the yeah. family. So. so I had this experience, and I talked to Nikki about it. I went out to visit with a family on Tuesday. Not, what the heck day is today? Wednesday. <laughs> I went on Monday, um, and this is a family who experienced our care with mom, grandma, and now um, pap is, um, is in our care. And, um, you know, the, the, the daughter um, was sitting right there during the interview, and, and the pap said to me, I feel so much better since I came into hospice. And I was like, really? Um, which is a testament, I think, to what Nikki had said, mind, body, spirit. He's like, those ladies come out, and they talk to me, and, um, and they take care of me and they make sure I get what I need and then I had a visit from one of your volunteers one Ross Curtis who is a veteran volunteer so we have a special program if someone is a veteran we'll go out and do a little ceremony this gentleman was a Navy uh, veteran Ross is a Navy veteran so they connected immediately and you know that's kind of the the piece and the daughter kept saying Oh my goodness, what they do for daddy is amazing, but the peace of mind that they give the rest of us just can't be talked about enough. So, and I think, Maria, to just uh, hit on that a little bit more, you know, when we go in um, with this team approach, it's really important for us to understand like, what I may define as important may not necessarily be what's important to that patient or that family. So sometimes just asking that question and, you know, training staff in, in visits with patients and families, like what's the most important thing we can do for you um, during this journey? What's the most important thing we can do to support you through this journey? And that certainly looks different for everybody. Right. Yeah. Very much so. And uh, you, you might describe uh, quickly, Nikki, what a team looks like because there's a, yeah. there's a, um, a religious component, there's a medical Absolutely. component, if you would. Yeah, so our team um, is, is comprised of certainly registered nurses, a certified nursing assistants. Um, we have a, a fabulous board certified um, a medical director who is uh, really responsible for the care of all of the patients in our program. Uh, Dr. Phillips, um, our, our, our non-denominational um, uh Chaplains, we have certainly social workers who help navigate family dynamics, end of life planning, um, are, and are, are certainly our volunteers um, as well who do everything as um, Maria mentioned from office work to um, <laughs> frying somebody oysters to taking them to sit on the beach um, at Cape and State Park. So. And, Which and, you can do now without 350 campers destroying your view. By the <laughs> yeah, way. there you go. Yeah. There and, you go. And we provide service to the Eastern Panel. What part of the Eastern Panel? Yeah, so uh, Berkeley, Morgan, Jefferson, and the Hampshire counties. Nikki, uh, this past legislative session, there was a lot of discussion about certificate of need, and I think just on casual observation that the folks from hospice have done a pretty good job of explaining why a carve out for hospices would be necessary. How much will you, if you haven't already been, be paying attention to future legislative sessions now as the CEO of hospice? Yeah, so I, I still think it's important to continue um, the same um, awareness and the level of awareness. Um, one of the things, certainly just in the last year, recognizing the uncertainty where I would go in this position, whether that was remaining in my chief clinical officer role or stepping in as the CEO to lead the organization, is um, I'm happy to say that I I sit on the the board and the a team for the state hospice council as a secretary. So really trying to stay very much involved with that council um, and, and remaining um, connected to be able to continue that support for cert certificate of need and the process. And um, we, for what 
Yeah, we recognize that that that's an issue that's likely to come up every year. Um, and certainly the Admiral and I will do our part to, uh, to, to raise that awareness, both on this show and really throughout the community. And Nikki, you too, you, um, you know, you're obviously well-schooled in, um, in the subject matter. Yeah, so. and, and I think thanks to uh, uh, forms such as this and other forms, our local legislators are, uh, understand hospice, uh, and they understand the importance of hospice. Uh, that not, does not necessarily uh, translate throughout the state. This is where the state council that you referred to earlier, and Margaret has been a leader of that, and you will assume some of that leadership uh it's it's very important from the state level to try to get the same support from all the legislators that we have with a local legislature sure absolutely well nikki i think you'll be pleased to know that bill and maria have done a good job of actually turning around the the opinions of elected delegates from this area with sure. their explanation as to why that carve out is so important you know yeah. let, let, without I'll, I'll brag on Maria more so than uh, me, but it's been gratifying to watch some of the legislators uh, that are, that are set around this table uh, and how much of a transformation they've gone through. Uh, some of them were were very against hospice and against this carve out and uh most all of them i think without exception they have come over and now they're very supportive yeah and we did some other work besides yeah, yes right. around this yeah. table yeah. but um you know margaret cogswell our retiring ceo who by the way last night threw out the first pitch at the Martinsburg <laughs> baseball game. Um, I don't want to say anything. I should have said something to Mayor Knowles. Was it better she, than Bill's free throw? Yeah, it was better than Bill's free throw, and it may have been better than Kevin Knowles' first yeah. pitch. I'm not saying. Kevin, if you're listening, sorry. Um, but at any rate, we also tried to set up individual meetings um, with folks because sometimes, you know, not that we put anybody on the spot here, um, Bill, but... But we did. Yeah. We did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, you're right. And so, some of these folks did not want to meet on a one-to-one -one with hospice right, initially. Right. Now they've, they're they Right, more right, ready. right. So it's been, it's just been good and, um, you know, and gratifying in so many ways. Again... Well, um, I'll tell you what, we got to get to our final oops, break here. Uh, Nikki, <laughs> hang on for a second. We'll be back with the final minute, okay? <laughs> 